Hello guys, um, uh, my name is Dr. Tasfai Kalila. I'm uh, one of the interventional cardiologists here in Atlanta, Georgia, with the Piedmont Heart Institute. Um, today, as part of the um, Ethiopian American Doctors Group lecture series on uh, cardiovascular medicine, I'll be talking to you on an uh, introductory talk on um, a structural heart disease. Uh, the objectives of this talk will, will be uh, to introduce the expanding scope of structural heart disease, to briefly review the common structural procedures, uh, to review common valve lesions, uh, particularly mitral stenosis and aortic stenosis, and to briefly outline available uh, percutaneous therapies. Um, I don't have any financial disclosures and uh, I will not be discussing detailed, specific uh, structural interventional procedures. Uh, however, uh, if need be, we will be discussing those procedures in subsequent lectures. Structural heart disease interventions uh, represent a wide range of percutaneous treatments covering a wide range of congenital and acquired diseases of the heart and valves that were previously treated surgically or simply not treated. As you can see in the definition of this heart, this um, segment of cardiovascular medicine, it does not include coronary artery disease and intervention like percutaneous uh, uh, interventions. Uh, if you step back and see the segment branches of the cardiovascular medicine, you can divide it into electrical abnormalities, uh, coronary abnormalities, and structural abnormalities, and the fourth and big part of cardiovascular medicine is also vascular medicine. Uh, any of these could be congenital or acquired abnormalities. Um, therefore, today we'll be just talking about this segment of cardiovascular medicine that is relatively high, uh, new and, and, and a kind of high yield for you guys as you see a lot of valvular heart disease patients uh, back home. Uh, the spectrum of the structural heart disease spans uh, not just valvular heart disease, but also some congenital defects in, in the heart, like atrial septal defects, patent foramen or valley, uh, also uh, closure of left atria pending in patients who have AFib and cannot undergo systemic anticoagulation, also closure of ventricular septal defect, paravalvular re regurgitation or paravalvular leak, a closure of PDA and management of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, closure of left atrial aneurysm, and also other structural interventions are all uh, categorized under this multidisciplinary segment of cardiovascular medicine called structural heart disease. So the key fact about cardiovascular medicine, as you guys probably know, uh, cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of uh, death globally in the, about 17.9 million cardiovascular deaths in the, in the world um, uh, reported just in the year 2016. Uh, and unfortunately, 31% uh, of all global deaths are due to cardiovascular disease. And over three-fourths of uh, this mortality is actually happening in the low and uh, middle income countries. And the two major cardiovascular killers are stroke and heart attack. And the stroke prevention and cardiovascular interventions, they do have uh, uh, crossroads that, uh, they, that, that they meet. Um, uh, two major uh, cardiovascular pathologies or problems that are strongly associated with stroke are presence of atrial fibrillation and also presence of patent foramen or valley in some group of uh, patients. As you know, atrial fibrillation is a very common uh, cardiovascular uh, problem that affects uh, a lot of people, uh, particularly non-valvular uh, atrial fibrillation in this country, and valvular atrial fibrillation is usually the driver in, in, in your setting. Um, and what happens with atrial fibrillation, as you probably know, is the development of blood clot in the left atrial appendage. And what we usually do for those patients is actually to initiate 
uh, blood thinners or anticoagulation therapy to protect them from future stroke development. However, uh, some patients by their very nature are the higher bleeding risk and they might have had uh, um, GI bleed or intracranial hemorrhage in the past and they're not good candidates for systemic anticoagulation. In that case, we uh, tend to uh, place uh, uh, this device called the Watchman device to close the lift atrial appendage and uh, uh, protect them from clot formation in that pocket uh, from, uh, to protect them from future stroke. Uh, this is a patient of mine, a 70-year-old uh, female who has a history of atrial fibrillation on systemic anticoagulation. And uh, essentially, she subsequently developed GI bleed and presented to the emergency room with, with uh, a severe anemia. Uh, because of uh, the presence of the right coronary artery uh, stenosis that would potentially require intervention down the road, we did not want her to, to, to get a stent and at the same time go on a therapy for her atrial fibrillation with triple therapy, which would require aspirin, plavix, as well as uh, oral anticoagulation, which would intensify her risk of uh, developing future GI bleeds. Therefore, we decided to place this uh, Watchman device, a 30 millimeter device was implanted easily in her left atrial appendage, and she uh, essentially went on to live a, a normal life. Uh, a patent foramen of valley uh, is the second uh, crossroads between stroke and structural heart disease. And as you can see here, uh, the PFO or patent foramen of valley is basically a communication between the right atrium and the left atrium. And if patients have um, deep vein thrombosis and in a blood clot can actually paradoxically traverse this patent foramen of valley and they can develop uh, a stroke. Um, and in the absence, you know, as you know, patent foramen of valley is very common in, and even in the normal population, about 25%. Um, therefore, we have to exclude other um, causes of the stroke before we attribute to this uh, uh, stroke as a PFO-associated stroke. If it is PFO-associated stroke, we can close this hole with uh, one of these two devices that are approved for PFO, the GORE uh, device or the Amplastic device. This is a patient uh, of mine, 37 year old female who had a, a CVA or a stroke, was uh, proven by MRI and negative uh, event monitor with uh, 30 days monitoring with no evidence of atrial fibrillation. She did not have any other alternative physiology for her stroke. Therefore, we performed a 2D echo, which showed the um, presence of patent um, foramen of valley with uh, right to left shunting. And her rope score was suggestive of um, a PFO being, being the cause for her uh, stroke. Therefore, we decided to close her uh, PFO with a 25 millimeter ASO device. Uh, and this is a fairly simple and straightforward procedure with the transvenous axis, you know, 8 to 12 front sheets, depending on the device size and uh, essentially deploy the atrial, the left atrial disc first, and then the right atrial uh, disc, uh, and subsequently patient uh, goes home uh, the next day. Uh, the vast majority of uh, structural interventions, however, is, is the valvular intervention, and the bread and butter of the structural intervention, even in the U.S., is severe aortic stenosis and transcatheter uh, valve therapy. Um, um, the second most common is mitral valve therapy, and of course, uh, pulmonic valve uh, is also the other valve that is usually treated by pediatric uh, structural interventionists. Um, three of uh, the four valves, as you know, um, have uh, FDA-approved transcatheter therapy, some sort of therapy. Uh, but the tricuspid valve is the only valve that does not have any FDA approved the device at this point in the United States. 
um, the tricuspid valves, the hence called the forgotten valves. And although a new, a new and new evidence is building currently suggesting that tricuspid regurgitation is actually not, uh, uh, not is, is actually associated with uh, increased mortality. Uh, so a bunch of devices are currently in development. If you look at uh, valvular heart disease and the structural interventions, you know, the incidence of rheumatic valve disease is on, on, is, is on, the, on the decline globally. However, um, this kind of um, precipitous decline has not been shown yet in, in the developing world. Uh, we don't see rheumatic heart disease that often in this country, it's very rare. Um, however, as you know, I, I did my medical school in, in Ethiopia, so I do know that, that rheumatic heart disease is actually very, very common. Um, on the other hand, degenerative valve disease is actually on the, on the rise in the Western uh, world, um, which is due, mostly due to calcific degeneration of uh, the valve. Whenever you talk about um, general management of valvular heart disease, you know you can approach it in four different uh, phases or stages, essentially. The most important and the cheapest way to prevent um, is, is to prevent. And prevention, when, when I say prevention, particularly in the context of rheumatic heart disease, is essentially to, to perform primordial prevention which is you know hygiene and uh, um, avoiding overcrowding and essentially to minimize the risk of developing uh, streptococcus uh, also in terms of you know calcific degeneration of valves you can talk about controlling hypertension hyperlipidemia um, also uh, uh, radiation all those things can cause valvulopathy Detection of the valve, on the other hand, is, is, is really uh, the second most important strategy to minimize the, the risk of developing or progressing uh, progressive or end stage valve disease. Uh, for example, if you're just uh, you know, waiting for the patient to present to the emergency room for mitral stenosis, they usually present to, to the emergency room late in the course of the disease, which is very, very troubling because at that point they might have had already end organ damage, they might have had pulmonary hypertension, have had right sided heart failure called pulmonale, and it's really that it's maybe too late uh, in, the, in, that, in, that, in that regard to, to really fix their valve pathology. Um, the, this, the third is surveillance. You know, if you detect the valve disease, you know, the, not every valvular pathology would require intervention at the same time that it was detected. So you do need to do some sort of surveillance um, uh, in terms of, you know, doing serial echoes uh, every, you know, you know, one to two years in the clinical follow-up in a valve clinic. Those are really, really important steps. And the fourth and the last one, obviously, is where we spend most of the healthcare dollars is to, to intervene on those patients who are symptomatic and they also have concomitant severe valvopathy. You know, believe it or not, you know, most of, not I shouldn't say most, but uh, about 50% of patients who have severe heart stenosis, they go undetected even in the Western world. And therefore, early detection is really, really, really key, particularly for patients who, who have uh, rheumatic mitral stenosis, you know, if they have the lesion and if they're not symptomatic and if you actually give them uh, antibiotics like penicillin, you may actually delay their recurrence. And if they don't have recurrence, and the fact that, that the fact is they, they develop severe mitral stenosis because of the recurrence of mitral um, recurrence of acute rheumatic fever. So you might uh, really prolong the time to, to the time when they need uh, intervention. <clears throat> So, um, so once you diagnose any uh, valve disease, meticulous follow-up is, is really, really key. 
in terms of surgery, you know, not every institution has a surgical backup. And if they don't have a surgery, the patient should be referred to a, a center that, that is capable of doing those surgeries uh, or a center that is capable of doing balloon uh, valve plastic. Uh, there is general variability of access to surgery in even industrialized countries. Uh, however, that is mostly because of the concept of surgical turndown, uh, which, uh, which means that the patient does have valvular problem, but they cannot really undergo the surgery because they also have multiple comorbidities that will put them at a very high risk uh, for for uh, to survive the, the surgical procedure itself. You know, if you look at valve disease, and I want you to look at it as a, a progressive disease, okay, there's, there's a, a, a valve disease that you're at risk, okay, which is stage A to stage D, which is se severe symptomatic valve disease. When you, when you say you're at, at stage A valve disease, that means you just have a risk. You may be hypertensive, you may have bicuspid aortic valve, you may might have had uh, acute traumatic fever, but you don't have a valve pathology yet. So that person needs to be paid attention to, their blood pressure must be controlled. You know, and they, they, they should get antibiotics for acute traumatic fever and manage accordingly. Stage B is progressive disease. Patient does have some kind of valvopathy. You know, they do have mitral regurgitation, mitral stenosis, but they're not severe yet. And stage C is they're severe. And if they are C1, they did not have any cardiomyopathy. But if they are C2, they they are they did. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they did have um, some kind of uh, cardiomyopathy that is stage C2. Stage D is in a way we intervene. Most of the valve pathologies, if you have severe aortic stenosis, and then if you have symptoms, which means you're symptomatic, severe aortic stenosis, the mitral stenosis, the same thing, then you do need something done to that valve. It's a mechanical problem, it has to be fixed mechanically. So let's take a look at the mitral valve. You know, the mitral valve is one of the two AV valves that sit between the left atrium and the left ventricle. It's also one of the most uh, intricate and I would say complicated valves of or the four valves in the in the heart. Um, it it has multiple, uh, you know. Uh, connections and uh, you know a pathology in any of these two connections uh, can actually result in mitral regurgitation um, in, a, in this uh, fibrous structure that anchors the entire valvular apparatus is called the annulus it is the saddle ship structure uh, which is kind of not on the same plane and actually the leaflets are attached to the annulus, the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet, and the closure lines of the leaflet is called commissures, okay? The closure line when the anterior and the posterior leaflets touch uh, is called commissures. That is what you need to pay attention to when you evaluate a patient with symptomatic mitral stenosis because that is where the valvulopathy happens and commissural fusion is actually a pathognomonic sign for rheumatic mitral stenosis. And at the tip of the leaflet, as you can see, there are these little string-like structures that are connecting the tip of the leaflet to the, to the papillary muscle. It's called, they're called chorda tendine. And the chordal insertion to, to this structure is called papillary muscle is where the, the mitral valve apparatus actually is. If you think about it, you can have mitral regurgitation either from the ventricular pathology, which is called secondary or functional mitral regurgitation, or you can have mitral regurgitation from pathologies affecting the valve structure itself. That's called primary mitral regurgitation. 
Um, the pathophysiology of uh, mitral valve uh, stenosis, particularly mitral uh, stenosis to secondary to rheumatic, is, 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 is essentially valvulitis. Okay, post call uh, pharyngitis can give you antibodies. Those antibodies essentially, through a process called molecular mimicry, confuse cells from non cells and destroy the tips of the mitral valve apparatus. And when that essentially heals, it causes fibrosis. Acutely, they may have mitral regurgitation, but going forward, subsequently, they will develop uh, mitral stenosis. In terms of mitral regurgitation, it could be primary valvular pathology, which is myxomatous mitral valve prolapse uh, uh, or fibroelastic disease. It could it could be you know cord the rupture uh, secondary to you know acute myocardial infarction. Okay, so it could be ventricular problem like S A T secondary mitral regurgitation. And the etiology of all this could be congenital or acquired. And the diagnosis of uh, mitral pathologies could be either regurgitant or stenotic. It's usually uh, by clinical evaluation as well as echocardiography. This is just a 2D uh, echo uh, showing the prosternal long axis. And this is the mitral valve, anterior defect of the mitral valve, posterior defect of the mitral valve. This is the aortic valve, which is just kind of to give you an idea of what it looks like with echocardiography, anterior septal wall, infralateral wall. It's kind of the apex, you don't see that wall. Um, so, in talking about mitral stenosis, we already talked about the uh, uh, etiology of mitral stenosis and the, the vast, the most common cause of mitral stenosis in the world is acute rheumatic fever. Okay. Um, the second most common, and in, in particularly in the Western world, is calcific degeneration of the mitral valve. The mitral annular calcification can happen, but most of the time that gives you mitral regurgitation not, uh, and not stenosis, but it can give you stenosis. Um, when you talk about rheumatic heart disease for, you know, for, for the purpose of um, you know, this talk, uh, you know, it, 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 I, I, I talk more about rheumatic heart disease because you know, I think that's probably what would help you the most because that is what you would be seeing the most uh, back home. And it affects children and young adults living in the developing world which is about 80% of the world's population is considered developing at this point. And at least 15.6 million people are affected by rheumatic heart disease. And so it is a disease of public health importance. And it obviously and unfortunately disproportionately impacts children and young adults living in low income countries. Uh, you know, we see rheumatic heart disease very, very rarely in this country. Um, and that is it's mostly due to population dynamics and you know you know migration um, and so sometimes refugee crisis. Otherwise, essentially, rheumatic heart disease um, is is very rare here. And like I said, it is a disease of public health importance compared to HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. Rheumatic heart disease or acute rheumatic fever. It is fairly underfunded compared to the impact that it actually causes in, in the world. This is to show you what happens with acute uh, rheumatic fever. Patients will develop a post call with pharyngitis, uh, and then they would have uh, valvulitis, and acutely they develop mitral regurgitation. Like you can see here, this color doppler showing you a posteriorly directed severe mitral regurgitation jet. And also, you can see this anterior mitral valve lipid is prolapsing. Okay, this could be directly from the infection. It could be annular dilation. Also, uh, posterior uh, directed jet is, is indicative of the presence of a lesion on the anterior mitral valve lipid. This is a postmortem pathology, just to show you how endocarditis or valvulitis can actually. Uh, it show you know um, an gross anatomy, and uh, you know those patients can have concomitant myocarditis, which could actually be the cause of their demise if they were to die during this acute phase of acute traumatic fever. This is a more familiar type of echocardiography that you guys have seen in the past. 
uh, it, it shows you chronic uh, mitral regurgitation and mitral stenosis uh, concomitant. And the way you tell it is chronic is that if you look at the left atrial size, it's big and left atrial dilation. There is uh, the volume and pressure overload. There is a posteriorly directed jet. If you see the mitral valve apparatus, it's very restricted. You know, it doesn't even in diastole, it's supposed to be uh, open. You know, it doesn't open freely. And as you can see here with my cursor here, uh, the anterior mitral valve leaflet is restricted and it's not uh, moving. That sign is as called the hockey stick deformity of the anterior mitral valve leaflet, which is very pathognomonic for severe mitral uh, stenosis of rheumatic origin. You know, if you think about what happens as a hemodynamic consequence for um, mitral stenosis, it's fairly simple, you know. Uh, what happens is um, there is mitral stenosis, there will be pressure and volume overload in the left atrium. The left ventricle is, is fairly preserved, really nothing happened to the left ventricle. Um, the left atrium will be dilated, there will be left atrial hypertension, there will be pulmonary venous hypertension, and there will be secondary change in the pulmonary vasculature and patient may have pulmonary hypertension that is, that is uh, with secondary changes that is permanent. And that pressure obviously will transduce to the pulmonary arteries and the RV will be dilated big and baggy and that will uh, cause congestive hepatopathy, systemic uh, anasarca, uh, and also, you know, sometimes they, these kids, they can have gut edema, a protein losing enteropathy, and they may actually die of malnutrition. Therefore, you know, as you can see, before patients develop uh, permanent damage to their systemic organs, um, we need to do something about this lesion. It's a mechanical problem. It needs to be opened up. Uh, and if it's not intervened either surgically or with percutaneous route, patients will, will develop this, uh, you know, kind of green consequences that we cannot really salvage them from uh, that late in, in in the course of the disease. You know, I can't emphasize this anymore. And, you know, um, um, echocardiography is really the cornerstone of diagnostic uh, diagnosis of um, mitral stenosis or any valve lesion for that matter. Uh, I do realize that we do a lot of very meticulous physical examination in Ethiopia, which is all perfect and I'm very proud of that. Uh, however, um, the, just the mere presence of mitral stenosis will not really dictate, dictate what we do for these patients. So we have to perform echocardiography. You know, you guys pick up all the, you know, the opening snap and, the, you know, uh, the, the diastolic rumble. And you can tell it's severe, but you can't tell me if there is leaflet calcification, you know, commissura calcium or subvalvular apparatus. Therefore, for me to decide which patients actually would benefit from balloon mitral valvuloplasty versus surgery, uh, you have to do echocardiography. Preferably TEE at some point if you're planning to intervene, but for monitoring and diagnostic purposes, do 2D echocardiography surface echo applies. There are different ways to assess severity of mitral stenosis, and we will talk about those when we talk about the echo session. Um, either myself or Dr. Nikias will discuss uh, those uh, diagnostic and, and, and techniques. <clears throat> but I would say one thing, you know, pressure gradient across the mitral valve is heavily, heavily dependent on heart rate. Therefore, you know, if there is one variable that you have to really depend on to assess the severity of mitral stenosis is valve area. So the management of mitral stenosis, just like anything in medicine, it, it, it starts with medical therapy. Okay, you have to stabilize the patient. If they have pulmonary edema, they have to be diagnosed, and they have to have optimal beta blocker therapy on board because tachycardia is essentially the enemy of this patient. You know, 
as you can imagine, the problem with mitral stenosis is diastology. They cannot feel the ventricle because the valve is too tight to open in diastole. Therefore, if for some reason this patient, this patient gets tachycardic, if they have fast heart rate, they don't have the, diastol the, the diastolic time will be compromised. Therefore, they will not have time to fill the ventricle. Therefore, they will develop flush pulmonary edema. Therefore, it's very, very important that we slow them down, give them some diastolic time uh, for them to fill the ventricle. However, like I said, mitral stenosis is a mechanical problem and the therapy is going to be mechanical therapy. It's already fibrosed. We're not going to reverse the severe mitral stenosis with diuretics or any other medical therapy. And in terms of intervention, it could be percutaneous therapy, or it could be surgical therapy. Um, <clears throat> the other complications of mitral stenosis that you need to be aware of is presence of atrial fibrillation. Because the left atrium is dilated, because there is left atrial myopathy, uh, patients with uh, mitral stenosis, uh, they are at an increased risk of developing atrial fibrillation. And the, the kind of the double-edged sword in this patient is that if you have atrial fibrillation, the risk of forming uh, left atrial appendix thrombus and even left atrial thrombus is very high as compared to those patients who have non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Now you have AFib and RVR, you have a diastolic problem that you can't feel and the ventricle runs really fast, that is gonna be, a disaster. Therefore, you have to make sure their heart rate is controlled and they have to be on systemic anticoagulation regardless of their CHADS to VASC score. You know, the CHADS to VASC score is the score that we use to stratify patients to see if they need systemic anticoagulation or not for those patients who have non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Do not apply that scoring system for mitral stenosis patients, please. And the only anticoagulant that is currently tested or approved in non toric in patients with, with valvular atrial fibrillation is actually comedin or warfarin. And pregnancy, as you know, is mitral stenosis is a really, really bad uh, combination. So we recommend that patients uh, you know, try not to get pregnant when they have severe mitral stenosis. If they have severe symptomatic mitral stenosis during pregnancy, it's probably worthwhile to give them below mitral valvuloplasty prior to the delivery to, to help them during that second stage of labor. So in terms of interventions, we can do balloon mitral valvuloplasty, which is a very mature procedure, or we can do surgical intervention. They're both class one indications, but if, of course, which one to choose depends on the favorability of the valve for this therapy. Um, surgery is, is done for patients who have unfavorable anatomy. That means their valve is very calcified. They have at least moderate to severe mitral regurgitation concomitant with the mitral stenosis. They also have other valvular pathologies. They have mitral uh, concomitant tricuspid regurgitation or aortic regurgitation or even aortic stenosis. So those patients seem to be doing better with surgery and get usually get mechanical valve. They have AFib, so the point is, you know, giving mechanical valve that would last them for the rest of their life, than giving them, um, you know, a tissue valve that will degenerate in about uh, 10 to 15 years, and they need another surgery. Of course, this to be handled needs to be handled on a case by case basis. As uh, some patients with, uh, you know, rheumatic mitral stenosis, they actually they would uh, like to get pregnant. And in that case, we have to really tailor uh, a therapy to their needs. You know, um, the problem with uh, mitral stenosis, rheumatic mitral stenosis, is commissural fusion. So the therapy has to be directed to commissurotomy, opening up the commissures that are already fused. And this can be done due to 
via surgical or percutaneous approach. And of course, I'm here to talk about uh, percutaneous interventions. So I'll tell you how we do this procedure. Um, and, and we've got our two systems. Um, the, there is a percutaneous balloon system called the NOA balloon. And there is also a metallic system that I have uh, never used. Uh, it, 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 in this country, it doesn't we don't use it? Uh, but the balloon system is uh, introduced to the to the market back in eight, 1984 by Dr. Uh, Inouye, um, um, and it was. Initially, it was done actually in 1982, but it wasn't published until 1984. <clears throat> so, um, before we uh, take the patient for a procedure or for balloon mitovaloplasty, mm -hmm. they have to be, you know, evaluated with 2D echocardiography and assessed for uh, for favorability. So, the appropriate patient selection is really, really key for successful outcome and uh, what we do with that is we essentially assess their echo score or the Wilkins score for mobility thickening calcification and the subvalvular thickening and we score the valve essentially from uh, you know 4 to 16 and the lower the number is the better on all, all this mobility thickening calcification subvalvular thickening will get a, a score of 1 to 4 and any score that is greater than eight will predict that the patient may not be a good candidate for balloon mitovaloplasty. So those patients typically undergo um, or undergo surgical replacement. However, if they have favorable anatomy, they will be a candidate for percutaneous balloon mitovaloplasty. Uh, like I said, this was initially introduced uh, uh, in 1984 by Dr. Enoe. Um, uh, to my knowledge, Dr. Inoue was recently actually in Ethiopia. He's, uh, he's from Japan. Uh, so it, it, it is my understanding that this procedure is, is done in some parts of Ethiopia, and it's a very successful and mature procedure. The catheter that is used is transvenous uh, catheter, and it's a transeptal uh, procedure. And the balloon catheter is made of polyvinyl chloride, the balloon itself is a very slick balloon. It has two latex layers of nylon and polyester micromesh in between the two layers. And the balloon is very interesting and it has a very uh, <clears throat> variable elasticity in a way that actually when you inflate the balloon at, at the mitral position on the distal tip inflates first. And you can actually pull it back a little bit and it will anchor on, on the mitral valve and then when you continue inflating in the proximal valve part will inflate and lastly the middle part which actually performs the commissurotomy will inflate last and the balloon comes in four different sizes so 24 26 28 and 30 millimeter balloon and the selection is based on height in centimeters divided by 10 plus 10 that will give you kind of the ballpark of uh, the size of the balloon that you need to use. Intraoperative details, you know, obviously, uh, like I said, it's a transfemoral axis, transfemoral vein axis, transeptal puncture, uh, and imaging guidance is usually with TE or fluoroscopy. Some institutions have reported that they use intracardiac echocardiography. Um, however, um, obviously, uh, in, in my experience, we use uh, transit of a gel echocardiography for um, most of our procedures. This is just to demonstrate how the distal balloon inflates first, the proximal balloon inflates second, and then the middle part inflates third, and that is what performs the commissurotomy. Expect the result of successful uh, Balloon mitral valvuloplasty, immediate uh, 10 to 25 percent improvement in pulmonary hypertension. But this is, you know, with caveats that uh, um, the reversal in pulmonary hypertension is, is, is only if you catch the disease early in its course. If the disease has already 
um, advanced pulmonary hypertension, you know, you may not be enjoying this great results. Uh, pulmonary artery pressure also declines as a weeks for months, and severe pH usually does not resolve completely. Atrial fibrillation uh, resolution has been reported in two patients, but persistent symptoms despite uh, successful balloon mitral valvuloplasty may suggest severe diastolic dysfunction. This is a 3D TEE just to show you uh, what uh, a successful balloon mitral valvuloplasty looks like. And if you, if you look at the, the, the third row here, you can see that the commissures, which is the closure line of the valve, is actually cracked. So that is called commissure rotomy. But what you do here in the green arrow, that is actually the valve leaflet was also lacerated. So that, that is not intentional and you don't want to do that. So a little tear that the patient did fine, but um, uh, if this is a really a major tear in the leaf plate of the valve, that may cause severe mitral regurgitation and that won't be uh, a good outcome. So what are the contraindications? Not every patient can get balloon mitral valvuloplasty. Uh, some patients have you know, left their trial uh, flat left the trap appendage or the free will. This is a patient that I took care of um, when I was a fellow in the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, she was a 50 some year old uh, Hispanic uh, female who came in with pulmonary edema and subsequently found to have severe uh, mitral stenosis. Uh, she really, in, in an interventional cardiology, was requested to see her for consideration of balloon mitral valvuloplasty, but at the same time, when we did uh, a follow-up echocardiography, we detected this large left atrial clot, so therefore she underwent surgical valve replacement and clot removal and also left atrial appendage ligation and the maze procedure for her atrial fibrillation. Uh, if the patient has uh, a more than mild mitral regurgitation, they're also not a good candidate for balloon valvuloplasty. And the uh, <clears throat> uh, severe concomitant aortic valve disease, also, like I said, uh, will be a contraindication, a relative contraindication of this to balloon mitral valvuloplasty. So in, in a nutshell here, uh, treatment and prevention of rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease would be key in, in the management of patients with rheumatic mitral stenosis. Really the, the key here is, is, is um, rheumatic heart disease is actually a very preventable heart pathology, really a one valve disease that can be impacted upon by really primordial prevention by, you know, early uh, detection of hygiene-related problems and the, the, the spread of the, the streptococcus of pharyngitis, you can minimize the risk of developing group A streptococcus infection, which is called primordial prevention. Uh, but once patients or uh, kids develop a group A streptococcus infection, primary prevention is going to be key because we have to treat that streptococcal infection as quickly as we can and as, 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 as early as, uh, as possible. And once patients, if that is, is not uh, caught there and patients may have acute rheumatic fever, and now that will be secondary prevention, but it's still very, very important that we have to make sure patients are well treated um, uh, for, for, not, for them not to develop valvopathy. Valvulopathies, okay. Uh, rheumatic heart disease may finally develop if we miss all these three stages of uh, uh, the prevention. Um, of course, that then the patients do have uh, mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation. In that case, we do what is called tertiary prevention. Really, not a prevention. It's just where we spend most of the healthcare dollars is where we try to optimize therapy for these patients who already have valve disease. And that could be valve surgery, that could be anticoagulation, that could be management of their heart failure. They may have stroke and now they're disabled, they, they may be in rehab, all those things. And of course, mortality is gonna be inevitable at that point. Before what I'm trying to show you here is that 
you know, if we intervene early in this group of patients with uh, high risk of rheumatic uh, heart disease, we really we can make a dent in the pathophysiology of the disease and also prevalence of this lethal disease. Um, this is the end of uh, my uh, lecture series for part one. In part two, you will be talking about um, uh, aortic valve pathologies. And, and if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to contact me and I'll be, I'll be happy to, to answer your questions. And thank you for your patience and your attention.